Good afternoon, I'm Giovanni Dennis with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're joining us online at onespotmedia.com. The police are probing a double murder in Jonestown St. Andrew Monday night. The two people killed have been identified as 35-year-old Omar Jarrett, also known as Brickback, a laborer of Penn Street, and 24-year-old hairdresser Janelle Thomas. The incident happened sometime before 10 o'clock on Penn Street. According to the police, residents heard loud explosions and summoned the police. And on arrival of the lawmen, the now deceased were seeing in a pool of blood in their one-bedroom dwelling. The scene was processed by the detectives and the bodies removed to the morgue pending a post-mortem examination. And in another incident Monday, five people were shot, two fatally, this time in Arnett Gardens. The shooting happened at the corner of Collie Smith Drive and 9th Street sometime after 5 p.m. These are the latest in a slew of deadly shootings in several inner city communities since the start of the year. A strong police military presence remain in the area. Temporary locations will be created to facilitate people seeking shelter in the corporate area. This in light of the recent attacks on homeless people in three police divisions, which resulted in four fatalities. Sandy Williams reports. Between Sunday night and Monday morning, six homeless people were attacked in the corporate area, of which four died while the other two sustained serious injuries. The brutal attack has prompted the authorities to consider additional homeless shelters to provide refuge for people seeking shelter, especially at night. Mayor of Kingston, Delroy Williams, says a transitional center for homeless people in the corporate area should be in place by the end of the year. He said the facility should accommodate 40 to 100 people. We are also in the procurement stage of, of the construction of a, of, a, of a transitional facility for them uh, on King Street. It would accommodate where we are looking for, it. we're phasing it, so we are looking at between 40 to 100 persons. Dormitory facility, doctor's care, nursing care, and psychiatric. The timeline we're looking at the, this, the calendar year and to complete by the calendar year. We are pushing to complete by the end of this calendar year. But until then, local government minister Desmond McKenzie says arrangements are being made to create temporary locations. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, several homeless shelters have reduced the number of people they accommodate. And according to Mr. McKenzie, other shelters are full to capacity. We do practice the social distancing, the protocol there, because the temperatures have to be taken, they have to sleep, you know, accordingly. So it, it poses a challenge and we can't compromise their health um, for anything else. What we are going to be looking at, there are open areas outside which are covered, which I will speak with the mayor to see if we can put some temporary bedding around there so that those who can't hold inside of, of the established uh, area be placed in those areas. You know, we, we have a large constituents of homeless people, you know. It is close to 700 of them in the corporate area. In the meantime, the police have increased patrols in the areas investigators believe homeless people might be targeted. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. To other news now, police in Manchester have increased their presence on the streets following Monday's announcement of a tighter curfew for the next two weeks to control the spread of COVID-19. One councillor in support of the measure is calling on citizens to comply. Shamala Pullen has this TVJ News follow-up. Manchester has been under the Minister of Health's radar for several weeks due to an increase in COVID-19 cases. The health ministry described the parish as one of two that is of major concern. So when the announcement came that the curfew in that parish will tighten and run from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. daily, it did not come as a surprise for many. In fact, counsel for the Belfield Division, Mario Mitchell, had called for stricter measures at the recent Municipal Corporation meeting. Mr. Mitchell reacted to the announcement made Monday afternoon. I'm in full support of calling for the lockdown until February 8th. I'm hoping that the citizens will take all precautions, will put all protocols in place and limit their gatherings just 10. 
what we find out is that Manchester is a population where we have mostly senior citizens. A lot of returning residents are here. So if we allow the COVID-19 virus to take seat in Manchester, then we're going to have some serious problems to face. Commuters and business owners and operators also hurried off the streets of Mandeville before 5 p.m. The Mandeville market, usually bustling with activities at that time of the evening, was empty by the time the curfew took effect. Mr. Mitchell is calling on more persons to comply with the protocols. From what I see, people are starting to change. As I said, I see about a 90% compliance of citizens who are wearing their masks, and I'm pleased for that. I've been coming to Mandeville maybe once a week. I don't come in Mandeville unless I have to and ask citizens that they can do some of that. People can carpool, people can ensure that one person in the house do all the business or the transaction for the entire home. But what we must ensure is that we try to comply as much as possible. And I think Manchester is a parish where the people listen. We're a loving parish, we're a hard-working parish. And I know the people know what this means, that if we have another lockdown. So I'm asking them to comply until February 8th to ensure that we have little bit of this as much as possible. Meanwhile, the police have outlined their plans to manage the curfew. They warn that a zero-tolerance approach will be taken for those found in breach of the Disaster Risk Management Act. We took a four-pronged approach to enforcing the special risk management that has been enforced on the parish. So we are we sensitize the persons first with bulletins so that we can get the message across to as many persons as possible. Then we took the approach of closing the business places at the 6 p.m. time recommended to give persons time to reach home. Shamela Pullen, TVJ News. 141 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 were recorded Monday. This has pushed the country's total to 15,153. Kingston and St. Andrew recorded most of the new cases, followed by Manchester and Clarendon. Meanwhile, one more person has died from the illness. The country's COVID-19 death toll is now 339. Meanwhile, the St. Elizabeth Health Department is raising concerns about a spike in COVID-19 cases in the parish. Recently, the health department ordered a church and a training centre in middle quarters closed. This after it was revealed that a number of persons in that area may have contracted the virus. A teacher at the training centre is also among those affected. And it's now time for a break here on the Midday News, but please stay with us. We'll have much more when you... Welcome back and we're continuing the news. A new study says food insecurity in Jamaica has increased. The worsening situation has been linked to the COVID-19 pandemic. Details in this report. The report from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA's Economic Research Service, revealed that 12.8% of the Jamaican population is currently food insecure, equating to 400,000 people. This is double pre-COVID-19 projections and an increase of 100,000 persons over revised projections made during the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, the USDA released preliminary projections that 200 thousand Jamaicans would be food insecure by the end of 2020. By the end of the year, it said the socio-economic impact of the pandemic had caused the actual number of persons suffering from food insecurity to exceed pre-pandemic estimates by 100 percent, primarily affecting female-headed households and homes with at least one child. The World Food Program COVID-19 Food Security and Livelihoods Impact Survey published in September 2020, placed a further light on the nature of Jamaica's food insecurity during the pandemic, with 70% of respondents reporting difficulties eating enough during the crisis. One in three survey respondents reported skipping meals or eating less, and one in 10 reported going a full day without food. Respondents indicated a reduction in household food stocks with 20% reporting no food at home. The survey confirmed that food insecurity in Jamaica was primarily driven by COVID-19 restrictions and economic conditions as opposed to supply-side factors. Janela Precious, TVJ News. The Redberry Main Road in Porous Manchester that was blocked by residents on Monday has been cleared. Residents blocked the road which is connected to the Southeast Highway now under construction. 
Trucks and other equipment on the site have had to stop working since 8 Monday morning. Residents say they are frustrated with the lack of attention on dust and noise pollution concerns they've raised. The house, them are deteriorate because there are so many people come there and say, um, them are take picture of the house and so. And as soon as they're gone and the vibration turn on, the place just a shake. My grandchildren, them sick. All me, when we get up a morning time, me hire a run like somebody a beat me, right? I mean, if I trouble with sinus, so they just give me sinus. We have no water. A drum is over there that they brought to host, um, to, to get um, drinking water. The drum full of dirty water, bus up, bus up, burn up, burn up, and I eat them car come to give me water for drink. Dust, are, me have my business place there, so dust, pure dust in there every day, me have a, a dust down. People are come, them are complain about dust, dust. Look how much dust. Pure dust are no compensation. Look how the government say enough to build on the, um, the river bank and them are build bridge pan. We walk and go so. Ambassador Sheila Seelimon Teeth has been appointed as the new permanent secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Mrs. Monteith will succeed Ambassador Marcia Gilbert Roberts, whose tenure ends today. She will take up duties as permanent secretary effective February 1. Foreign Affairs Minister Kamina Johnson Smith made the announcement earlier at the ministry's virtual press briefing. We are sad to say farewell to our Permanent Secretary Ambassador Marcia Gilbert Roberts. We commend her unwavering commitment to public service and contribution to national development, as well as her humility, professionalism, and promotion of excellence as head of the Jamaican Foreign Service. With the changing of the guard, Ambassador Sheila Silimonteith, who recently returned from a successful tour of duty as Ambassador of Jamaica to Belgium, will assume duty as permanent secretary with effect from the 1st of February. In news overseas, former American President Donald Trump's second impeachment case is now in the hands of the U.S. Senate. More from the CNN. A historic march through the halls of the U.S. Capitol. <laughs> Nearly three weeks after a deadly insurrection took place within its walls. Nine House impeachment managers delivering a single article of impeachment to the Senate Monday night, formally beginning the second impeachment trial against former President Donald Trump. Donald John Trump, President of the United States, is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. Ten House Republicans joined House Democrats last week to charge Trump with incitement of insurrection saying he encouraged a violent mob to storm the U.S. Capitol January 6th in an effort to overturn the election results. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. The House also pointing to Trump's phone call with Georgia's Secretary of State earlier this month, asking him to find votes to reverse Trump's loss. In all this, President Trump gravely endangered the security of the United States and its institutions of government. Senators will be sworn in as jurors later today, and a trial will begin the week of February 8th. The timeline allowing Trump's team to prepare and space to confirm President Joe Biden's cabinet nominees. It's not going to be easy to manage all these things at once, uh, but it's absolutely imperative. Biden telling CNN he's doubtful there are enough Republicans willing to convict Trump, but he also believes the impeachment trial has to happen. Dis to news and sports, dream deferred but not denied. Despite a 2017 accident that derailed his Olympic dream to compete against able-bodied athletes, Marlo Rodman has switched focus to the Paralympic Games, looking for a chance to become the first paracyclist to represent Jamaica at the Games. Denise Walters has his story. Marla Rodman saw his dreams of competing in the Tokyo Olympics vanish after losing function in his left arm. However, after encouragement from Dr. Wayne Palmer, the president of the Jamaica Cycling Federation, Rodman took up paracycling, this time with an eye towards the Paralympics. Dr. Palmer says Rodman was heading in the right direction until COVID-19 hit. 
However, with the pandemic halting all cycling events, including paracycling, Mr. Rodman was unable to enter the necessary qualifying events. We are still hoping that some of these qualifying events will eventually be held and give him a second opportunity. Dr. Palmer added that there are also other factors that are presenting a challenge. The approval of a COVID protocol to allow training at the national stadium, in addition to the ability to travel to other countries to participate in qualifying events and the necessary quarantine that may ensue in between events. Not daunted, Rodman, who is doing physiotherapy on his left arm, is still working out on his own. There are some days I will go into the mountains, like I'll drive from here to go to a plantation house and drop back out in Bagwalk and then go up to Europe and, and come back home. Uh, sometimes I'll just stay on the flat. God that helps to build good cadence when you stay on the flat. Um, strap this onto the bike, try to tense the shoulder as much as possible to get some kind of use from this arm and do the workouts. He admits to a never give up attitude, reminiscing on that mindset at the 2015 Caribbean Championships. Last lap, the road away and leave me. And I'm like, okay, you just have to settle for a third place because two guys rode away with me. I'm like, no. Went up the hill, went up the hill, and I saw them out in the distance and I started riding. 400 meters from the finish, I saw them. I'm like, whoa. My head swelled big. <laughs> My head raised. And I just sat on the bicycle because I was feeling some cramps. And just pedal, just give it, you know, 100% to the finish. And I won. And since then, it just keep getting better and better. Also certified as a paracycling coach, the 32-year-old Rodman has words of encouragement for persons going through a tough time. I would say to other athletes out there, don't give up on the dream, you know. Don't give up on the dream no matter what the circumstances is. And just keep pushing and putting the best foot forward. Rodman will have to compete in a classifier event to be classified by cycling's governing body, UCI. Denise Walters for TVJ Sports. A story of sheer grit and determination. And that's how we end the midday news. I'm Giovanni Dennis. Join us at 7 for primetime news. On behalf of the news, the sports and the production teams, have a good afternoon.